I always feel a little bit uncomfortable presenting on things that I don't feel like I'm an expert at. You want to talk to me about the work that I do in my real job or mental health stuff, I'll talk to you all day long, but this is always a little anxiety producing for me. But I will say, I'll start out, I asked Jerry to just put some, uh, we got some slides, I just want to show you some pictures, a little bit about how I got started in using an airbrush, and then I'll try and cover some stuff about how the airbrush works and how I see it applicable to wood turning. Um, so. Jerry, um, so I started out as a wood carver, um, and I will tell you, I'm going to show you two quick birds that I have, and the important part is actually the base, because I blame these two birds for me getting into turning. Um, so I, I started carving back in the 90s, and I did songbirds, and it got to a point where people were ordering from me, and then all of a sudden it felt like a job, uh, so I stopped doing carvings. But I also... Um, that's the first base I turned. And it was on a little tiny lathe I bought at Fleet Farm. And there's screw holes in the bottom of all those bases because I had no idea how to connect them to anything but the faceplate. Um, but I'll just have you flip through here, Jerry. So the next one is just that base is another one I turned. But the reason I started airbrushing was a couple of things. A lot of times the bases that I made had pretty intricate stuff, like I would do a pine bow and I had all needles that were made out of wire and I had to figure out a way to paint them. And so airbrush was just a good way to do that. And then it also became one of the things I figured out when I was painting birds, I hated that part of it, but the airbrush made it a lot easier to blend colors. And so when I was painting a bird and a transition would happen, if I did it with a brush, I'd have this sharp line. And there's a couple of carvers out there. I think Pat Gooden was one and he had these fancy brushes you could use to blend things. And I thought, okay, I'll try his stuff. I did that for about three months and couldn't figure it out. Um, and then tried an airbrush, somebody suggested that. So anyway, so that's how I got into airbrushing was just by doing the birds. And I got into the carving by doing the bases for the, or I mean into the turning. And when I kind of fell in love with the turning was because I could finish a project in a day and a bird might take me a month to do with like a couple hundred hours in it. Cause all those lines in there are all burned in with a wood burner. Jerry, on just have you go to the next one. So this is just my shop. Those are, I got stacks of bowls everywhere. I don't know if all the rest of you are like me, but I don't actually finish a project and you'll see that in some of the other stuff I'll show you today. But so I, I'll just flip through these Jerry kind of quick. So those are vases that I've got sitting around. All of those are probably going to be colored at some point. I, I take, a, you can see some of the birds that I've got down there that I've not painted yet. And then again, these are, I probably have about five different spots in my shop where I have stuff that's a quarter done or a half done um, that I'll go back to. And I'm looking for a few different things. So those two top vases on the left, those are things that are, they just have some interesting character to them, but not great color. So I like my natural stuff to be darker. Um, and when I have kind of plain wood, then I start playing with embellishment. And those little things on the side, I've got a couple of them I brought along just to show you. So I'll pass a couple around that are on there. Jerry, if you want to just flip them. So those are things that I'm carving. So I'm, uh, and again, I'll, I'll do kind of intricate things on stuff. Jerry, if you want to just keep going. So that's one I'm just passing around. So I just was a very plain piece of wood. Um, and I, so I put some feathers on it and eventually I'll get the airbrush out and paint those. That's my workshop. And I just showed that cause there's a little hole on that bench and that's my dust collection system. Um, this is my new shop in my new place. Um, and it is 12 by about eight and a half. So it's a tiny little shop. Um, made it a lot easier to keep clean than my two two stall garage one I used to have. Um, anyway, so that I have a carving station set up right in there, so I can turn a dust collector on and carve in front of that, and it's again much cleaner. That's just a, the second one I'm sending around here is just a piece that shows you maybe what I'm thinking as I get started. So I'll have you flip, and these are just some tools I use. So I, we've had some. Other people demonstrate the carving part of it. In bird carving, you use a lot of rotary tools. Um, so that machine, I'll put a different handle on there with a rasp on it, a big thick one, and that, that'll kind of rip wood off really quick and get me to the shape that I'm looking for. And then the next slide, 
just shows that's a detail, more of a detail carver. Um, and, and that's a handheld that's not much bigger than a, a thick pen. And I'm using that to do details um, like on the birds and stuff. Um, anyway, I'll keep going here. I like to experiment with all kinds of stuff. I like playing with fire. Um, so that's a torched platter. Um, I just torched the outside of the rim and then turned the inside afterwards. And I used an airbrush on that, but you can't tell at all in this picture I realized after I sent it to Jerry, but that's got a blue kind of hue on it. So these are things, so I use the airbrush for a couple of different things. I use it for stains. Um, and these are two different brands of stains that I've used. The one on the left is just a general finish, I think. Yep. Um, and that is water-based stain. Um, so I use that on my turnings. I find that that if I'm trying to keep something smooth, that it lifts the grain more than the than the um, chestnut stains, which are more of a spirit stain. Um, so I'm kind of moved away from that uh, general finish stuff. If I'm going to do it, I'm usually sanding it down. I'll wet the piece first, sand it back before I put the stain on it. That helped with some of the lifting of the grain. But um, so those are just two different things I would use. So I, I thought I should talk a little bit about safety. So Linda and I actually had a conversation a few months ago when she knew I was going to do something on airbrush. And I thought, oh, I could bring in a vase and I can show you how I kind of use the stain and transition. But it is, there's so many fumes with it that I'm wearing a mask whenever I'm airbrushing, particularly in my small little shop. Um, but whoever was sitting here, would have just gotten blasted with fumes. Um, yeah, and so then they would, you know, how when you turn without a mask on, you're, you got brown boogers. These are blue or green or whatnot. So anyway, I, it's pretty important to have some way to suck it up because you are, it's like using a small um, aerosol can, I guess. It doesn't have the same gases in it, but, um, but it's, it, it floats in the air. So I thought I wouldn't do any of the, stain stuff here, but I'll just show you some pictures of it. So that's a um, one that I've done that stain. I'll, I'll grab a couple more just to show you. Um, I didn't have pictures of. So this would be one and I'll put these over on the um, gallery table just so you can see them, but they're transitioned. So it's going from green to blue. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how I do that, but I'll get through these slides quick first. Just another, so for me, that was a piece of black walnut I thought was gonna be really pretty. And when I turned it, it was very kind of dull. And so I switched it up and I carved some just uh, lumps in it and then I painted it. Um, and again, so I'll just keep going just for a couple other examples of different things. So that's a vase. I'm, I don't know if I brought that one in here. That's probably about 17, 16, 17 inches high. And that's one of the things I like to do is if it's got interesting character or interesting grain in it, I'll try and highlight the grain with the colors. So I'll take the airbrush there and I think that one has three different colors. I use purple, green, and yellow, but I can also then, it blends a little bit. And I don't know that the, the picture does it justice, but it blends the colors together as it's going. Um, and again, looking for things to highlight. So this one was kind of a tiger stripe um, in the wood. And so I will do different colors of stain to try and highlight that. So all those really bright colors or the lighter colors, I started with yellow stain um, to try and highlight that. And I've got, a cup, I've got another one here that's similar. I'll pass that around for you to see just kind of what it's looking like. So on those, I'll, I'll take those light spots in the wood and highlight them and then pick another color to go over top. That's just another, the other side of that piece. And then, and that's just another vase that I did um, with the stains. So, all right, Jerry, what else we got there? So that's my kind of, um, that big black box is an, a dust collection system for the airbrush. So when I'm doing paint, I'm usually doing paint on smaller stuff. That would be an example. Um, I'll send that around to you. I've got the one I'm working on, but that, Booth is 
just like a dust collector. But what it's doing is sucking the fumes and you, can, you can't really see, I didn't take a very good picture, but the filter in the back is all full of paint. But as that fan is on, it's drawing that through um, and capturing all the overspray. And then you can see that hose that's hanging there. That is my airbrush hose. Um, I do take it off when I'm done using it each time. One of the things that happens when you're using the compressor, as you know, is it, it has condensation. One of the things I didn't realize when I was doing it is that condensation will sit in the hose if I leave the hose lay on the ground. Um, and then when I go to airbrush about halfway through while I'm airbrushing, it'll start spitting kind of water mixed in with the paint. And I'm like, what, what the heck happened? So I hang my hose upside down so that it can drain out if there's any condensation in it. And then you can see those. There, so I thought when I was gonna do this, I'd try to do a picture, but I'll tell you that that's the only thing I've ever painted that was flat. So, all right, that's it for the slideshow. So I just have a couple of things I thought I'd also show here. I don't know where the, so this is a vase. And again, I'm looking for, how do I highlight what's going on? So this one had a pretty cool grain pattern, but not much color to it. So underneath I put a black um, and then sanded that back and then sprayed a little bit of white stain on the top and then tried to blend the two colors. So that's just blue and uh, green together and that blends in the middle. It's part of a transition. Um, this particular pot is just leaves, trying to capture some fall colors. And this is uh, turning that didn't work well. And so it's just my experiment. I'll, I do this a lot. If I have something that I don't like or breaks or doesn't look well, I've got a couple of them that I've cut in half and I'm you know, experimenting, but I'm trying to put color combinations together, see what I like. Um, Anyway, so those are all things that I would put stain on. These are some things that um, I would do where I'm at. This is paint. So this is different than the stain. The application's a little different. Um, but these are things that I have done that I've painted on. And again, I'll just throw those up at the gallery. But you can see I've also done some piercing in them. And some of this, uh, there's a gentleman named Bin Ho. And I think we had a video of his here at one point. Um, but some of this is inspired by some of the work that he does. And these are just the first two that I tried where I did the piercing on them um, and tried to add some stuff to them. So you can see there's some, all of the stuff that's on here then is airbrushed in, in paints. And then it, this is just another one, again, kind of similar to that pattern that he used, but you'll see I have little parts of everything that I've talked about here. So I, I've carved holes through the middle. Um, I've airbrushed some colors. It's not, this is like an in-work project, but I'll take the, um, these flowers and I've taken the grinding tool, that little kind of detail one, and I'll put some texture in there and what it does is it takes out the paint where I overstrayed and didn't want to cover it. So um, all those little dots are just drilled back in with the carving tool. So I'll pass that one around too, just so you've got an, I can see it. All right, so I apply all those things um, with an airbrush. I have three airbrushes. Um, started out with this one. Um, I don't know how to say it. I think it's Posh, but this is a, the brand name is Posh. This is what I started with when I was doing my birds. Um, this particular airbrush probably runs about 170, 180 bucks. It has three different needles that go into it. So it, in the airbrush, there's a needle. The needle is, comes in different sizes. So I can go from a very tiny fine line up to a thicker inch, inch and a half of paint at a time. Um, and I can do that with this brush by just switching out the needles and changing what you want to do. So this is what I used. This is probably 20 years old. Um, still runs the same as it did when I got it. Um, doesn't look quite as pretty. The cup is dirt, you know, looks 
stained on the inside. I only use this airbrush now for stains. Um, one of the things I found with this one, there's a diff there's three different kinds probably of airbrushes. There's probably more than that, but there's something called a single action airbrush where you push down the button and you're gonna get paint and air at the same time. This is called a double action. So when I push down the button, air is gonna come out, but no paint. And then I pull back on the button on the lever to get paint that comes out and that comes out faster if I pull back all the way and slower if I'm just pulling back a little bit. So there's a single action and a double action in an airbrush. And then there's a siphon feed, which is this, where it comes out of the bottom of the airbrush. And then there's a gravity feed. And the gravity feed is um, the other airbrush I have. And I'll just pass this one around too, just to give people an idea of kind of what it feels like. And um, so this is a gravity fed airbrush. It's also a posh. Um, I actually bought these two primarily because they're made here in Wisconsin. Um, the company is down in Kenosha. Um, I also have a Japanese made one called an Iwata, um, Iwata Eclipse. And so anyway, so this is an airbrush. And again, generally how it works, the paint, this is gravity fed. So the paint's gonna go on the top. I push the button down, that's gonna emit some air. I pull the button, lever back um, to control it. All right, what else do I wanna cover? before I start showing you how to do it. There are different types of paint. Um, and I just have some brands here, but these two paints are opaque. Um, one's a golden brand and one's the Posh brand or Poshy, I'm not sure how you say it, but um, those are opaque. So what that means is when they go on, they're gonna be a more of a solid color. Um, what I do on the stuff particularly these things that I'm doing on turnings, I'm using transparent paints. Transparent paints um, don't go on as solid. They go on, as they say, transparent, so you can see through them. Even if straight out of the jar, you can see through the paint as it goes on. You have to layer it to get to the kind of darkness that you want. Um, but you can then blend colors on it um, as you go. And so an example of that, I don't know how well this will show up, but on that butterfly, that's a couple, that's yellow and then what makes it orange is I just did a red over the top of that color. So if I do it with transparent, it works way more like a stain, which I like, because then I'm not putting a heavy coat on and I can control a little bit about how it works. Um, yeah, so Lynn's question was, are they acrylic? Yes, they are. All right, so I also say, you don't have to be uh, an artist to use these. I think some people think, oh gosh, that's really intimidating and you have to control it. If you try to do a painting, you have to have pretty good control over your airbrush. But if you're doing, um, if you're doing some of this stuff, you're using stencils or other things to cover them up, uh, to cover up what you're not painting or sometimes what you are painting. I have, I just brought some in a folder, but I have all kinds of stencils that I use. I've got circles, I've got things that I just use for texture. I have things that I see and find in the store and go, oh, that might be interesting. So I've got little branches where I'll just hold that against something. And then when I spray, I've got that negative. It's not spraying where the leaf or the pattern is, um, I use air freshener, uh, your dryer sheets. Those work really well. If you kind of stretch them out a little bit, you get really cool lines. So if I'm doing something that looks a little bit more like a sky or something like that, I can put lines in it. Um, I use a lot of paper towel when I'm airbrushing, um, but paper towel makes a great um, contrast. So in the thing that I was sending around on the inside, there's some circles. I just did those last night to just experiment with them and show you some different stuff. But those where it looks like there's lines in there and they're jaggedy, people would use it if they're painting flat stuff like a cloud. Um, the paper towel itself will give you waves depending on how you rip it. And again, I'll give you a, a quick example of, or I'll show you how 
some of that works. So I brought along just this project and I thought I'd show you how it works. I don't know if we'll be able to see it here if we switch. So there's also something called Frisket. And this is where I was saying, you don't really have to be an artist. I didn't draw these butterflies myself. Sorry, Cleet. I didn't draw these butterflies myself. I made, that's just a pattern that I had. A pat, I drew a picture, cut it out, put that on there. So I've wood burned that on. There are a couple different ways that you can transfer a pattern on. You can do it just with the frisket. Some people to put the frisket through a printer. Um, I just drew this on with a cutout pattern and then I have airbrushed, or not airbrushed, I burned the dark parts of it. I find that easier to do when it comes to the painting part, if I'm gonna paint. Um, Frisket comes in the sheets that I just showed. It comes in giant rolls. You can get all different kinds of sizes of rolls. This came off the roll. It's a piece that I just cut off last night. Um, so I'll just show you, I'm gonna try and show you how it works. My hand stopped shaking here. Well, who knew this was gonna be such a challenge? Oh, come on. Maybe I'll show you. Okay, when your hands are shaky because you're not comfortable and then you get less comfortable, it just gets worse. So frisket is just a very thin sheet of plastic with adhesion on it. I use a lot of different things to actually cover up wood. So masking tape, like you would use if you're trying to trim a line in your, on your wall, I use masking tape in the same manner. I might not use masking tape over something that's already painted. So when I did the second butterfly here, I didn't cover the first one with masking tape. I use frisket because it's a lot less tacky. Um, I also, if I'm doing it on something that's painted, I'll put it on my arm a few times to try and get the tackiness off even more. I don't want it to pull up the paint that I just put on that's fresh. So frisket is, again, fairly simple to use. You're just putting it on. The, the biggest challenge is to not get air bubbles. So I put that on starting in the middle and I'm just trying to work my way out. And I actually have a tool. I didn't, I realized I didn't bring along. It's kind of, it's just a piece of plastic, kind of like a credit card that will just continue to push the air out to get it laying flat on your, on your surface. If it doesn't lay the way you want, you can take it back off. This stuff has got enough tack to it that um, I might manipulate it a couple times to get certain air, you know, certain spots where there's an air bubble out. I will take a little bit more time with it and flatten it down. I'll try not to do that because it's probably like watching paint dry. Um, so the next step then would be I'm taking uh, X-Acto knife and I'm just cutting that frisket back off. Um, and what I'm doing is, so I'm just relieving it on the spot that I wanna um, get it done at. Okay, and it's a little harder to cut when you're shaky too. Yeah, it's Lynn that's got me nervous. All right, I'm gonna set this down to try and stop the shakiness. All right, so all I'm doing is following around the outside line here. And this is again, probably like washing paint dry. Could have done this beforehand. All right, so I'll talk a little bit more about the airbrush and the setup. So with the airbrush, um, you need a compressor. 
Um, I honestly don't even know. I probably look on it, but I don't know the brand of the compressor I have. I bought that also probably over 20 years ago. Um, I got it from, it might be Harbor Freight. I don't know if they were around back then. Um, but I bought the cheapest little air compressor that I could get. Again, it was before I was interning. Um, I don't know how a big air compressor would work. I'm sure it would work um, okay, but I would think it'd be really loud, or at least mine's really loud. Um, and I would be more concerned about the condensation the larger the compressor got. Wow. Ooh, I've been so shaky. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I'm not sitting down with it in my lap to hold it still. Yeah. I'm not usually the wine glass, though, till after. And then I'm more of a bourbon guy, Tim. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Lynn's asking about cleaning. Um, yes. Water for my paints. There's actually a cleaning solution and I'll show you that too. Um, I'm just about done here, folks. Sorry. Um, but the, yeah. So on the airbrush, I will say one of the things that I didn't know in the beginning was maybe how to clean it or how to switch colors. And so that was a little complicated. And I thought I would show you that part because in, in my mind, the worst part about using the airbrush when I was doing birds was the cleaning it afterwards. I would spend more time cleaning my airbrush when I first started than, um, than I was painting. It just felt like it took forever. There's a ton of little pieces on it that you need to take apart. What I learned later on is, um, there are secrets to keeping it clean while you're working. One of those is how, okay, so I'm gonna now cut out or pull out the portion that I've cut off. And again, a little more, if I missed a spot here, cause I was shaky. Yeah, perfect. That was what I was going for. I'm going to leave that just hanging on there and paint that as well. Um, so when you're using an airbrush and you're applying the paint, what I did in the beginning before I kind of figured it out, and if you watch a YouTube or if you um, were like listening to somebody trying to teach you, they tell you this, but it was easier, well, hold on. Apparently I can't speak and function at the same time. All right, I'm rushing here and I just need to slow down, sorry. All right. So this is, I've just removed the, the butterfly, the insides of what we're trying to, what I'm trying to accomplish here. So when you're using an airbrush, I was talking about that double action idea. And so when I'm, when I'm letting the air out and then painting, I have a tendency to just lift my finger off. And that's what most people do when they start. So if you're using paint, and you're doing the airbrush, and while you're painting, you lift your finger off, you get something called tip dry, and your needle will dry, the paint will dry at the end of your needle. And so that was what started, that's what clogs up the system. And if you can figure out how to turn it on, pull the trigger back to let the paint out, and then put the back to just air before you let the finger off, that stops, doesn't stop all the pit, uh, paint dry or tip dry, that happens regardless but it slows it down. And then the other thing I learned is just keep it wet. And so in between colors, if I was putting on more frisket or doing something else, I'll just leave a drop or two of cleaning solution inside there. 
and then blow that out at the end before I switch colors. Um, so I'll just show you then, I'll, sorry, clean up a piece that I just ripped off and didn't cut off. All right. So I talked about the paints that I use. These are acrylic paints. I do water them down. When I was painting birds, I actually used paints out of a tube um, and mixed those up. So these are airbrush paints. They're more specific. What I like about doing it on turning is I'm not trying to do something realistic. So I have some more freedom to kind of do whatever I want. But I take those and I thin them down um, anywhere from 10 to 50%. Um, and what I'm looking for is a consistency kind of similar to skim milk. Um, and then a little goes a long way. So some of these paints I've had, actually my paints usually go dry before I use them up. Once I open a bottle, they, they last for a long time. So again, one of the other things I'll do is I always try testing it out on, usually it's paper towel. Um, I usually have a couple of them hanging somewhere. All right, so I don't know where we're going from here, but now all I'm doing is, now all I'm doing is making sure that air bubble is is covered so it doesn't squirt underneath. So I'm, there's a tip on the airbrush. When I am working, I also take the very end piece off. There's a little bit of danger to that because now the needle that's inside is exposed and they're very easy to bend. Ask me how I know. Um, so if you drop it and bend that, it, it's not functional anymore but I like to take it off because I can get finer lines and I can see exactly where I'm going with it because I can now see the tip right where it's coming out as opposed to just that wider space. So, um, yeah, correct. It's a, yes, probably smaller than that actually. Um, Yeah, so when that's over, and that's over to protect that tip so you don't, if I drop the airbrush right now, 90% chance I'm gonna to need to put a new needle in there because um, it will it will bend very easily. In fact, when there's tip dry, I'm also pinching it with my fingers and just pulling the tip dry off of there. But I bent them because I tried doing it with a rag or something else where it just caught it enough because it's very thin at the end. So I'm now, God, I'm gonna, stop shaking or I'm gonna have paint all over Jerry over there. Um, so again, I'm, I'm testing and I, I would say if you're gonna, if you haven't used an airbrush before, you have to practice. Don't try it on something the first time. And it, with the posh, there was a little book, gave me some practice things. I thought, oh, I don't need to do that. I'll just figure it out. Um, after a while, I went back and did the practice things, but it literally it gives, you know, put a dot, dots on your paper and try and hit the dot. Because you're not, it's like, like a pencil where you're touching it. And then make your dots bigger and make them smaller. And so practice lines and other things. So you're doing some of that. I do that sometimes when I'm starting out. If I haven't airbrushed in a while, I might do some practice on a paper towel. That's a great way to practice um, because it's absorbent. If you do it on paper, it spreads out all over the place. Although if you do it on wood and you're too aggressive, it also spreads out all over the place. So in my shakiness, we'll see how I do. But again, I'm now starting in the middle and I'm just laying a yellow layer over everything. And I'm actually on the, I, you probably can't even see it, I'm not sure but I'm starting out on that frisket. So I'm starting out on this outside and I'm coming in or starting here at the bottom and I'm coming in. So you can, can you see that? That just spider webbed all over. So I just sprayed too much. Again, feeling a little shaky here on, but the other thing I will tell you, if you try this and you haven't before, is that it's, it's way easier to do it with layers gradually than it is to do it 
to get one color all at once. So what does that mean? You put like three bolts on? Yep. So I can. I don't know if you can see here on the paper towel. I can put a real fine covering that's very hard to see, or I can blast the color real dark. That real dark color will do two things. It will spatter, like I did in the beginning here, but it also just doesn't allow me to control how much color I want. And if I'm doing something like this, I want it to be a little transparent. I want it to some of the wood to show through. I also want it to be able to blend colors together. And I'll show you that a little bit with the red, but I'm gonna, so the other thing that you can do with your airbrush is, if you don't pull back on the trigger, it's just blowing air. So you can do that to dry off what you've painted. And again, acrylic paints need to dry before you put the next layer on. And so now you're watching paint dry, um, but I'm drying it with the airbrush here as I'm chatting with you. And so the other thing I would say is, um, I lost what, I, what the other thing I was going to say. So I'm going to keep trying for a minute. Yeah, so the layers I, I'm going to do, I'll use red to try and blend it together and make the orange color that might come on a monarch butterfly. You can do the same right with any color. I have no idea if the blue one was just because I wanted some contrast. Um, and I got a weird clicking here, but that's all right. So I'm going to do another layer. And I'm just trying to build up the intensity of that color. So I'm going to leave that sit for a second so it can dry. And I'm going to just show you some other stuff on a, on a different piece that I have here. Um, this is just a piece of poplar. And the other thing is where I was talking about, you don't have to be super artistic to be able to do this. You just have to be able to use that knife without shaking too much and use tape or other things. So I have a variety of sizes of cut tape. You can see, I don't know, this one's probably a 16th of an inch uh, roll of tape. And those tapes can also then be put over whatever you're spraying. So I'm gonna do a little more yellow here just to And again, I'm going to go a little faster here than I normally would, just for time's sake. All right, so it's not coming out. I got some tip dry. I'm picking that off with my fingers. Yes. All right. That's of course going to happen, right? So that I get some tip dry and something's happening that's not coming out correct. Now I'm going to have to figure that out. Well, this makes it look way worse than it is because it's not typically, I don't usually run into these kind of problems and I didn't bring a wrench along to pull it apart. So what I'm guessing is I've got another, potentially, I've got dried paint on the top of here, which I usually would wipe off before I start dumping it into the thing. I'm afraid I probably got a piece of dried paint in there. All right, now it's working again. So again, I'm gonna go back to this and I'm gonna do this a heavier coat than I was than I would normally do. I'm not worried about it, the spidering and stuff. So the other thing I think I, I thought I'd show is in the beginning, I also had trouble with changing paint. So then I would go in there with a Q-tip and think I had to clean it out. And um, I use a bottle. I use denatured alcohol, just a squirt bottle. It's a little more condensed than where I'm usually working. But if I want to change colors, I'm just filling that up with the water, I'm dumping it out. I do have a little pot here that I don't know what it's called, but it's really just for cleaning out the airbrush. So I'm now spraying through that water. Um, 
if I'm changing drastically from one color to another, I'll also put a few drops of cleaner. And there's airbrush cleaner on the market. I think this came with a set of the first set of paints that I have again, so this might be 10 years old. I have two other little bottles. I don't use a lot of it, um, but I do use it at a as a final cleaning to run through the airbrush also. So now I'm gonna just check to see I've got the color out and I'm gonna switch. And again, I didn't wipe off the top, so hopefully I won't get any chunks of paint in there. But that would be something else I would say if you're using paint. Um, if you're using paint that's in a box, and these were, so I also take, I said I, I thin it. I know these are about 50% water and 50% um, paint. And that's really not water. I have an airbrush, um, an acrylic thinner that goes to, re, it's called a reducer. Probably brought that along too, I did not. But it's a, another jar of reducer. But I'll take that out of the regular paint jar, put it in another one so I know what my mix is. Because um, again, in some applications, I might want it to not be quite as transparent. So then, then I'm just gonna show you kind of how I might blend that yellow and red to make an orange. And I'm overlapping and I'm just gonna All right, and I'm gonna leave that sit and I'm gonna switch back then to, I probably would put a couple more color uh, coats of yellow on this typically. Um, but again, I don't need you to watch me forever and I still am shaking. Wow. Coffee. Yeah, I had coffee. Oh, that might be it. <laughs> so, Again, not that there's a right or wrong to how to do it, but then I can start blending the colors to get the color I want. And I'm gonna stop with this and again, just go back. Cause I would futz around with that a little bit more. Probably would have been smart to bring a non, a, a project I didn't really wanna finish. But here's the other thing that happens then when you do color or the tape. So it allowed me to blend from the yellow to the orange to the red. And again, I did that very fast, but I would be a little more precise and careful when I was airbrushing it. But, and now I can't get the tape off. Nope. Um, so the question was, am I blending dry paint? Yeah, I'm blending dry paint. So the paint, the first layer, in theory, I would wait longer, but 10 minutes, I would dry that paint and then I would just paint right over. But because it's transparent, it's blending it. It's, so it's cha changing it from red, yellow to orange to red, as opposed to if I use this paint, which is not the transparent, it's opaque, whatever I put this on will now be orange. So it doesn't, there's not a bleed through so that I can see through it. So again, if I was doing something larger and I wanted to create a wave or lines, I can do that with the tape. And I put that tape on last night, some of those thin strips that I had showed you before. Um, so last thing I'll try and show is a little bit more about how the transparent works. So I put a piece of frisket on here last night. Um, Frisket's interesting. I also, in one of my um, pictures that I showed, I had a hairdryer hanging near my stuff. Hairdryer is a great way to dry acrylic paint, unless you have frisket on, on your piece, because it works fine. I mean, you know, it, it dries it really well, but then the frisket gets real stiff and does not want to come off very well. And then it leaves some of the glue residue back on it. So I'm just gonna, <clears throat> so on this piece of frisket or on this piece, I just cut out a couple of different spots and I'm gonna just show you how the transparency works. So I've got, I've laid down a little bit of red in the middle <clears throat> and I wanna now, I'm gonna make that a little bit darker 
but then I want to transition it out and make another. So this allows me to take the same color and in steps, and I think I probably have done it uh, on the one that I, that large piece that I sent around that I've been playing around with the last week as I got ready for this. Um, I have some spots where I think I've got some squares or triangles on there and I put stripes into them. And it allows me to do the same color, but different intensity of color. So now I've peeled off another layer of that frisket that I cut out. And I'm putting it down. But I can still go right back over the red so that intensifies where I did the first layer. Then I've got the second layer. And again, I can, well, and again, I would wait for this to dry a little bit so that wet frisket will likely bleed on my hand and somewhere else. Um, So then overall, I was able to make that pattern, change the intensity of the color. Don't know how well that shows up. Um, but you, again, and I'm doing that with more patience and a, a little slower than I'm doing it here, but I can then blend the color that I want. And if I wanna keep a line in between it, I use that frisket to have a clear line as I'm transitioning the color. If I don't want a line in it, I'm just starting out and laying the dark on the bottom and then blending it over the top a little bit as I go. Stains work the same way. And again, I think that's one of the things I really like about, I use stains on bigger projects. I don't use uh, acrylics usually on stuff that size. Um, so that's how I use the airbrush. It's kind of how it works. Um, when I'm done, I run through the same gamut. I will, start out with some, I also have a squirt bottle of the cleaner. Um, so I'll start out with this. I always have a bucket. This is just a little bucket to bring her on. I have a little bigger bucket at my workstation just so I'm not making a mess. Um, but it cleans out fairly easily. Um, then I'm gonna leave some water in, spray it back in the pot. This is just to flush it all through. I can see a little air bubbles here, which means that I don't have it completely tight. And I need another piece of paper towel quick. So you can see that I'm just checking it and I've got a lot of paint left in there. I knew that I would. Um, I would throw I, this probably two or three times to just clean it out. But now it's running clear already, you can see. When, I, when I've got water running through clear, I'm gonna grab the tip again just to make sure there's nothing on it. Then I'll put cleaner in it. And it's just a squirt or two of cleaner. And again, I'll probably get more color because once it stops, nope, so this is already clean. Now, if that's all I used it for today, I will just leave that. I don't have to take it apart and clean it. Um, and I have, used it probably five, 10 times without actually cleaning it. Um, but occasionally, or if it starts to sputter and you have problems with it, this whole thing comes apart. There's about four or five different pieces. The back comes off. There's ways to, you take the needle out the back. You do have to give it a deep clean every once in a while. I'll take those parts. I'll sit it in a little bit of dish of soap of that uh, cleaner, and then just wipe it off with a paper towel. Um, or a cloth. So that's kind of how I do it. Um, there are different ways to make it more convenient. I just have, just like you would on your air hose at home, I've got um, things so I can pop it on and off. I can switch airbrushes if I need to. I don't typically, again, because I just have figured out how to mix those colors. In the past, I didn't know how to mix those or clean it out. So I might just switch to another airbrush for a different color. Um, Let's see, other things I would say about it. I had sent the, um, the other airbrush. Lynn, can you hand me that? So this has a little bucket underneath for the, the paints. This just pops right off. 
And I have about probably eight or 10 jars with lids and a little tube that comes out that's the same size that just pops on. So when I'm doing stain, do the same thing. I'll just pop that jar off. If I'm blending that green and blue that I showed earlier, I'll just pop the jar off. I'll put a new color on. I'll spray through until the color changes and then I'll switch. So I could do, so I could do five or six different colors at a time if I wanted. I don't want to put that much probably on a turning. Um, and then I, the other thing I was telling Tim is when I'm doing staining, because it's creating a lot of stuff in the air, I have an air filtration system. I do run that. I'm not sure how much it actually helps with the paint. Um, but I also will, I might do four, I have four or five pieces that I'm wanting to stain before I pull everything out to do it. Um, that painting station I have, I leave set up for the smaller stuff. But if I'm doing the bigger stuff and I'm using the stains, I might save it till I have four or five. I do those right on the lathe. I usually cover up with some paper towel my chuck. Um, and then I have some, they're plastic for, for the end. So as I'm painting, I don't care if that one gets covered with the stain. But all right, any questions? All right, thank you. <laughs>